Hi, this is Kevin, and we just had a fabulous meetup, monthly meetup, where I invited Brad to speak on private money lending and also talked about market update, what is going on in Sacramento, whether it's a seller's market and buyer's market. Make sure you check out the video. Make sure that you follow us. Yep. Hit that subscribe button. Uh, the agenda of today is uh, we're just gonna do like a brief introduction. We're just gonna go around, tell us who you are, okay, where, where you live. Uh, these are all the cities that I can possibly come up with, like in the county of Sacramento. Brad is coming from like far away. Um, so not in, <laughs> in Sacramento County, but it's okay. Um, what you're doing right now currently and what you need to get to the next level and how can we as a group help you collectively, okay? Uh, I'll give a, a, a brief market update in about this house, 1118 one, one, Acacia Avenue. Um, some of you have been here before, um, like during, um, and um, yeah, like it's, you can see the transformation that we have done and how AI has helped our business, okay? So artificial intelligence, specifically, I'll be talking about ChatGPT. How many of you actually have used ChatGPT before? And how many of you have actually found it help helpful in your business? Okay, I'm gonna mention a few tools that help my business, real estate fix and flip business. And uh, I'll talk about my mastermind, some freebies, and then I'm just gonna hand the floor to, to Brad, and you know he's gonna be the main speaker of this event today. All right, next slide. By the way, can you guys see this? Yeah. It's okay? Okay, cool. Anyway, so let's just go around, if you don't mind, just briefly tell us your first name, last name, okay? Um, and uh, actually, sorry, this is, this is my ask to you guys again. Uh, I'll have a sign-up sheet that's going to be passed around. Just uh, write down your first name, last name, and email, and I'll share this with you guys. And once the video is ready, I'm also going to uh, attach a link to you guys so you get a sign-up uh, of all the people in the event. Don't worry about just in exchanging information that's gonna be met uh, uh, readily available to you like a two, uh, one or two days later, okay, after the event, okay? Um, so, uh, Stephanie, can you help me with that? Like maybe a sign up sheet later. We don't have to do it now. By the way, Stephanie is kind enough to bring us some donuts and uh, some water. So you feel free to grab some like afterwards and stay for ho however much long that you like, okay? Okay, let's move on to the next slide. I'm gonna give you like some market update this is what I got from the MLS. Okay, so there's nothing secret about this, proprietary about this. Um, this just comes with being a realtor. Homes for sale in September 2023, 1,166 units, and that's up 3.7% compared to last month. So you can say that we have a rising inventory. However, we're still down 46.2% compared to last year. So what that says is that um, we're still lower, um, in a lower inventory um, compared to last year, okay? Basically by like almost uh, 50%. Homes closed in September 2023, 825. That's down 13.9% compared to last month. And it's down 26.9% compared to last year. So I, I think that this is due to the higher interest rate. This happened, right? There's just not as many homes that's, uh, that's closed as of now. Homes placed on the contract is also down 8.1% compared to last month, and it's down 6.6% compared to last year. So um, you can definitely feel the effect of the rate hike, and um, there's just lower buyer action as a result of that. Um, higher inventory than last month, but 50% lower inventory than last year. So there's that squeeze, okay? There's that like lack of supply. And as, a, as a result of that, home prices are not falling as expected, even though we have a higher interest rate environment. Next slide. 
Okay, so this is on the average price per square foot average sold price per square foot in September 2023 is $339 and that's up 1.8% compared to last month and it's up 3.7% compared to last year. So sell price stays relatively strong. Okay, again, uh, we're getting that appreciation, if you will, of like 3.7%, 2 to 3, 2 to 4%, I would say. And, uh, and notice that this is actually the sold price. Okay, so these are houses that, are, that were sold and they're like almost 4% higher, right, than, than last year. I would say that that 4% is actually due to appreciation. Okay, all right, next slide. Um, so this slide is days on market for all the homes that's on the market for sale. Uh, this is uh, uh, in, in September 2023, 24 days, okay, you put a house on the market for sale, okay, on average, it's sold in 24 days. How long has your house been on the market for sale? 14 days right now. 14 days? Wait, wait, wait one more week, you, you'll get an offer. <laughs> and that's up 4.3% compared to last month. So it takes longer time to sell because we're going into the fall, but uh, it's down 27.3% compared to last year. What that means is last year, things are flying off the shelf, right? It's three quarter of this time, basically, for a house to be sold. So that's uh, what, 18 days compared to 24 days, but still like very low, like less than one month. Okay, and so versus original list price percentage, in September 2023, 100%. Uh, so basically it just means that it's priced right, all these homes. If you price a house to be sold, $400,000 is gonna be sold for that much, okay? 0% compared to last month, up to 3.1% uh, compared to last year. So again, relatively low days on market, uh, you would expect longer days on market going into the fall and homes are so higher than last year but still a very competitive competitive market does that make sense to everyone here all right next slide <clears throat> uh, market update uh, average price for sale and sold usually I don't look at this number because this number is not really a reflection of, um, of prices that's sold. So I, I look at average sold price in September 2023, and that's, this is in Sacramento, by the way, $606,000, okay? So this house is being sold for 425,000. That's way below the average we're talking about. So you can buy like a 550, $600,000 house or buy a house for 400, flip it for 600. There's still buyers out there. That's essentially what this is telling you. And that's up 1% compared to last month and up 5.4% compared to last year. Again, I would say from the previous slide to this slide, there's about three to 6% appreciation, year over year appreciation. Um, and uh, basically that just said, is saying that price is really healthy and we're, even though in a recession, uh, uh, but it doesn't appear to be considering how high the interest rate is right now, okay? So if you ask a realtor what, 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 what market we're in, the realtor is going to be like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, there's, a, there's actually a meme by Jasmine, she sent me the other day, it's kind of funny. Um, what was it? What, what, did you, what did she send me? Do you have that me? It's, it's crazy. I, I'll, I'll have to show you guys. Okay. When someone asks if it's a seller's or buyer's market and you don't know anymore. Can you see that? Can you see that? You ask me, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's the answer. Yeah, exactly. 
All right, next slide. Um, average price for sale and sold up to homes. Oh, okay, this is a uh, skip. Yeah, skip this one. This is from the previous presentation. Uh, market update, months of inventory. So anything that's less than three months, that is seller's market, three to six months. That's an average market. Over six months, that is a uh, buyer's market. So we're, we're at 1.4 month. So we have less than three months worth of inventory. So we're still in the seller's market right now. Uh, even though we're up 17% compared to last month. So it, it takes a little bit longer for houses to be sold compared to last month. Uh, actually last month inventory was 1.2 and this month was 1.4. A little bit higher inventory, not by much. Okay, and we're still in the seller's market. And it's down 26% compared to last year. So what that means is um, um, last year, um, we had more inventory last year than this year. And I think that's why the price is, is, is being propped up now. I, I, I can understand why that's the case, right? Because if I were the owner, um, I'm looking for a house to buy. A house is gonna be worth probably two, three, four hundred thousand dollars more than the house that I bought it for at a way higher interest rate that I had before. So why would I sell my house in exchange for something that's way more expensive in price and interest rate, right? So just put your shoe in the uh, put put yourself in the shoe of a seller. Uh, I, I can understand why, like you know. Uh, we're getting that squeeze in terms of inventory. There's just not as many people that are selling right now. Okay, uh, next slide. So this is going to be my conclusion of all the stats that I've given you is if you're a buyer, I would uh, advise you to wait because of the higher interest rate. Obviously, Josh, you're, you're just taking over the loan, right? So it's not really affecting you as much, yeah? Um, you won't be getting as big of a discount as before, okay? Um, interest rate continue to be higher than before. Uh, I think uh, it was just a week ago, 8% uh, is official. It's official, okay? And it's gonna go higher. Maybe in two weeks, Fed is going to release another report. Let me, let me keep the rate or let me raise the rate again and ho hopefully that, that's going to be the last time they're gonna raise it but uh, it's, it's not definitely helping uh, the real estate market right now, okay? If you're a seller, you can still sell, okay? Price is relatively healthy, considering how high the interest rate is right now, and still the seller's market, all right? And if you're an investor, um, there is uh, going to be, uh, I don't know what I'm saying here. <laughs> okay. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you want to get a good product out, and uh, you will get uh, multiple offers. Okay. Like I think this is a good product, and it's priced very competitively. So I think that uh, we're gonna get multiple offers, and this is gonna be off the market soon. That's my prediction. So if you have a very good product, because I'm looking at all the listings out there, there's just not as many. There's a lot of crappy ones out there. And buyers are very picky nowadays because of the higher interest rate and whatnot. So they're very careful of you know, the last money that they spent. So you want to make sure that you take care of pests, right? Section one. And um, we have everything in this house too. Central heat and air upgraded bathroom, kitchen, like all the brand new baseboards, um, like sheetrock, uh, texture, everything. So that's what the buyer wants. So if you put this on right next to another home in the ghetto, right, this, this is considered a ghetto, this, this house is gonna be sold way faster than the other one because buyers are picky nowadays, as they should be. Next slide. Uh, so can you go to the next one? Okay, so I want to talk about this particular house, okay, where we got it from, 
uh, it's actually a wholesaler. He's part of this group. He introduced the deal to us. Uh, we bought it from him for $210,000. This wow. was uh, on July 31st, okay? And he got on the contract for 130 or 180. Okay, we were gonna pay him 215 for it, but then after the walkthrough, I'm like, hey, the most I can pay you is 210. But he still made $30,000, like in a span of like one month. Okay, uh, we spent $68,000 on rehab, uh, windows, central heating and air, a little bit of roof repair. There isn't a, a illegal addition that we had to, you know, uh, tore it down, um, attached to the to the house. We built a brand new fence on this side, also on that side. Had to trim a big <laughs> tree in the backyard. You, you can cut that, by the way. <laughs> okay, uh, ARV. When we comped it three months ago, was 405. So we're gonna list it at 425 and see how that goes. I think it's what, 424, 999, something like that? Stephanie? She's gonna be holding the open house after. Yeah. Yeah, she knows the number. So, I mean, if you subtract all the holding costs and you know, the rehab, uh, the acquisition costs or fee, it's, it's about $105,000 uh, in a span of, uh, what, October 31st? So it took us about three months to do this job, probably another two months to sell it, what, uh, in five months? $105,000, what do you think on that number? Nice. It's all right, right? Yeah. So um, if you're interested in being our gap money funder, okay? So we actually have somebody that gave us, I think it was like uh, $50,000, and I found the other 20,000. Usually we just do a denomination of 50. We don't ask for more. Uh, just reach out. I have, uh, we're, we're, we just, we closed two deals last week and they're being flipped as we speak. Uh, speak. Uh, one in 95823, the other in 95824, they're all in South Sac. So, uh, so we have two in the pipeline for flipping right now. And we got two more that will be closed beginning of November. One of them is gonna be a short term rental. It's, it's in Roseville, it's got a pool. So, oh, nice. yeah, Great. you'll like it, you'll like it. Um, so we're always looking for deals and we're always looking for capital partners. So if you're that person, please feel free to reach out. All right, uh, next slide. So I'll show you some before and after. Oh, okay, fine. Um, I just wanna kind of lay out how artificial intelligence has helped my business Okay, so we do a lot, a lot of SEO. How many people know what SEO is? Okay, it stands for search engine optimization. We do that so that we can be friendly to Google. So when people type in sell my house fast, Sacramento, our page, our website is one of the ones that's gonna appear on the top of uh, Google's uh, first page of Google. Okay, so we would, uh, prompt ChatGPT to write uh, the skeleton of a blog article targeting certain keywords, okay? You can get those keywords from uh, AREFs, okay? From those uh, keywords from AREFs. And then once you have that skeleton um, blog article, feed it to phrase.io, that is going to expand the skeleton article for you and it's going to optimize it so that there's a certain score that phrase.io uses so that uh, it reaches this uh, score so that it doesn't look like it's, it's written by AI, if you will, okay? So that's what we use. The other thing that we use, which is really helpful, <laughs> this cuts down my time of hiring somebody on Fiverr to do a short for me, which is, which is $10 per short. I'm not trying to take away your job, <laughs> right? <laughs> There's this Chrome extension that we use, okay? Whenever you open up a YouTube video, it's called Transcript and Summary Chrome extension. Make sure you download this. You click one button, it summarizes this 20 long, 20 minute long video for you into like 10 points. 
And then you can ask ChatGPT to write a script, okay, based on the summary or the transcript of this video for a reel that you like to record, okay? And then we feed it to captions. It's an app on your iPhone, okay? Where you can use the teleprompter feature to actually record a reel, up to 60 second long reel. And then my VA will just bring that video. I will download the video, give it to my VA. She will use Cap CapCut to remove the background and replace the background with a green screen. So we just released one video where the green screen is actually virtual. Okay, it was like my home office, right? Um, messy uh, background. So we replaced the background with like a modernistic, minimalistic office space. Uh, he, could, he could tell, Ryan could tell, that was a fake background. Yeah. But you have to kind of perceive like very carefully you know, do, do that. And then how many of you have actually heard of Sub Magic? Oh, make sure you check it out. So it actually places caption for you. Okay, I'll transcribe it and then place this caption for you. You can have Mr. Beast kind of caption style or template. You can have, uh, what's, uh, what's the other person? Uh, uh, Alex Hormozzi. Uh, yeah, all different. They, they have the, the template that they use. What? Well, I wanted to ask, is that, not like ChatGPT, there's the free versions, but how much is it for the other ones? The phrase and the sub magic? That's $40. Fra phrase dial is forty dollars. Okay. Caption, I think it's a subscription on your app, on your iPhone, maybe twenty dollars or something. Yeah. For yeah. Um, so it offers more than just subtext. It does B rolls too. Go ahead, go for it. Oh. Oh. Hi. Oh, thank you. Oh, coffee. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right, we got some coffee here, but anyway, um, do you guys know B rolls? Yeah. Okay, it's, it's, it's those like uh, motion graphics that you insert, so it's not just me talking for like the the next sixty seconds, right? Uh, if I if I mention like chairs or insert chairs or whatever, like if I'm like just you know, like, you know, just giving up money like that, you insert like somebody like that doing that, you know? Um, <laughs> that's really good. Caption, this is not the caption on the, on, on the video I'm talking about here. This is a caption that it writes for you when you, you know the, the caption section of an Instagram post? Okay, you wanna get the hashtags, you wanna get all these uh, keywords, okay? So it gets the caption for you based on the transcript that it gets from the video. So there's like emojis that you will add and blah, 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 and also hashtags. Have a seat. By the way, this is Dante. He's a local wholesaler you wanna connect with. He was the one who wholesaled me this house and I asked him to come here. Okay. Yeah, and <laughs> you'd probably be good at that corner here, okay? So the thing with chat GPT here is the prompt. Like you gotta yeah, you gotta make sure that you ask the right questions. So key is the prompt for chat GPT. And if you're interested in learning all the prompts, actually I save all the prompts for me and then I give it to my VA so she can just repeat the process for me. It's part of like the systems and processes that we talked about so much in our YouTube channel. Um, so we can delve into this uh, uh, deeper next time. All right, next slide. Um, just some before and after. Uh, these are before pictures of um, the living room. Okay, and also the dining room. We had that like four chair, table, four, four chair uh, table. Uh, remember it's there? Yeah. I don't know what happened to it. Um, we actually virtual stage this, this, this place. So this is what it will look like with the f virtual furniture in, the, in that room right there. Um, okay, this is, this is actually there. Okay, um, next slide. That's the living room. 
before and after, and this is the kitchen. Okay, so this area, this is all, this is all tile. There's like tiles here, we ripped out all the tiles. Okay, and we just kept all the, um, the, uh, the cabinets. Because they were pr fairly new uh, when we had it. So we just ended up keeping those. And there's the sliding door that's leading to that the illegal, uh, uh, unpermitted addition. So we had to like tore that out, okay? So that sliding door actually just leads uh, to the backyard. Okay, uh, and we, we actually bring down the, the, the wall cabinets. So there's actually a gap, okay, in between the ceiling and the cabinets up on the wall, okay? Because like, um, it doesn't really make sense for a, a grandma to actually reach out to the wall cabinets. Uh, so we make it just so that it's standard height over there. Okay, so that's the kitchen area. Again, that's just virtual staging over there as well. Um, what else? Next slide. Um, that's the hallway bathroom. Like, there's like actually a skylight, so we close that off, okay? And um, there's uh, those wooden posts on the wall, so we ripped that out, uh, we she rocked the whole entire bathroom. There's this long uh, vanity, which is made, made it 36 inch, okay? Um, you can go and take a look, it's just like, I just like everything like really clean. Um, and then we put in the new showers around over there. Uh, I like the, the contrast between the, the black and the white. So we got the matte black mirror and the black faucet. Um, and then you get that vanity from Home Depot for like $250. Why yeah. did you close off the Um, It was leaking. Okay. Yeah, it was leaking. So we had to like re-roof that section um yeah we just feel like yeah there's no need to keep it by the way the central heating air is blowing cold air because it's not connected to the gas valve the furnace so it's it's, it's kind of cold i apologize for that yeah uh next slide uh so this is the before after uh, in one of the bedrooms, and I think this is the room that's toward the, the corner. Uh, there was a crack window because before we took over, there was actually a squatter yeah. climbed over through the window, Sorry. sleeping in one of, the, uh, one of the rooms over there. Um, hey, so sound. Did you tell them about the story when this was a... Uh, yeah. So we found the owner. I had to open this uh, little thing right here to the attic, but it was actually open when we came in, and we were just like, oh, that's probably the owner, but it was actually just water. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, they yeah. went up there, yeah, and then just whatever, do whatever out there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. What they were doing. Um, we changed out all the windows, too. I mean, we kept those windows the same because they're the dual pane. Uh, other than that, we changed all the windows. Um, next slide. So this is the outside of the house, like pink color, I don't know. <laughs> uh, so right now, we just repainted the house, right? Um, just made it like kind of like earth tone, like very natural color. You have the grayish uh, on the white trims, okay? Um, just so that, it's, it's a color that can never ever go wrong. But if you have like a house that's on a pink color, I don't know what kind of a clientele or a very small minority, exactly, Barbie's house, yeah, um, that you can um, um, promote to. Um, what else? Oh yeah, we, uh, we, we purchased 10, 10 yards of barks, um, just redid the landscaping in the front and also in the back. There's that big tree that's hanging over the roof, so we had to cut it down or, or trim it, and then there's um, the fence, uh, there wasn't any fence actually. It was a dry rod fence, so we had to replace that fence about like 150 linear feet. Um, good that, uh, you know, we share that cost with our neighbor. Uh, next slide. I think this is the last one. Okay, so that's it. Uh, ba -ba -ba. No, let, let's skip this. I do want to mention one thing about the mastermind, then I'm going to hand the floor to Bradley. Next slide. Next slide. 
Okay, so uh, I'm doing a weekly mastermind. It's more like an accountability, okay, with like the local wholesalers, investors. The purpose behind it is to just keep each other accountable. And we do R&D on what works, like what kind of marketing strategies. I know he's like into cold calling, big time cold caller here. Um, and then we're trying to build, build off of each other's network um, of real estate professionals, okay? And we try to potentially monetize each other's leads. Like if you have a house, you can't like move. Maybe I know somebody or maybe I can move, move it myself. Uh, you must be prospecting already. That's, that's uh, the top qualification. You must be able to meet weekly. And there's no ego, please. $100 a month to getting. That's the financial commitment. Um, and then if you can con contact me if you're interested. Um, next slide. Uh, ba -ba -ba. Next slide. So here's some freebies. Uh, these are articles and uh, there's a QR code that uh, you can take a screenshot of uh, that um, will um, take you to our newsletter that um, is released twice a week. Okay, that's done by AI. It's, it's a hybrid actually. <laughs> it's a hybrid of AI and also a, a, a human uh, curation there. Uh, again, um, you can uh, capture this too. Um, we'll post our monthly meetup event uh, over there so you get notified. And if you want to invite me to speak on your podcast, to your tribe, or just uh, want to have a cup of coffee to pick my brain, just feel free to you know contact me on these social media channels. All right. So next slide. All right, so, um, so there's three ways of partnering with us. You can get paid a referral fee if you want to be a bird dog or wholesaler. You can negotiate with us. Uh, if you're a realtor, um, you can uh, represent us as the buyer's agent and get paid 2.5% and then list that house for us when it's ready to go and then get that 2.5% as a listing agent. Or you can become investors uh, with us in deals that uh, you know, we, uh, we, we remodel, okay? Um, all right, next slide. Uh, next slide. Next slide. All right, so I want to hand the floor to Bradley. He's very kind uh, to just come to speak to us about private money lending, gator lending. Uh, he's a fellow sub two member um, in that community. Do you guys know Pace Morby? He's a big, big creative financing guy. All he does is creative financing. He does like, uh, he would just buy deals with no money down, okay? So I want to, him to speak on that. Can you go to the next slide? Just on his bio. Okay, so Bradley Blackburn, he is a passionate real estate investor dedicated to transforming properties to profitable ventures with the focus on fix and flips and cash flowing, high cash flowing acquisitions. He is transferred from a background of underwriting and personal fin finance into asset backed strategies with investors and partners across the country when Bradley isn't working on his next real estate transaction or project, he enjoys skiing and hiking with his, fam with his family in the Sierra Nevadas. All right, let's give Bradley a round of applause. Do you have the microphone? Thank you, Kevin. Yep, I got a microphone. All right, thank you for that. So I don't have any slides, but I did bring my laptop um, where we can, um, Go over comping. I know that everyone loves that, right? Looking at listings, figuring out the price, and then getting that, that jump start on your next project. Um, I use PropStream and Privy. Um, I, I swap credentials with someone, so I pay for one, <laughs> they pay for the other. <laughs> Which is also um, gives me the ability to give you guys any lists if you ever want to look anything up, um, or if you ever which want a quick report, quick second pair of eyes, I can offer that to you. Um, you know, obviously, 
free of value so we can just find a project together that we can both close on later. Um, I'll also, uh, if you guys are interested, show you a little bit of one of my underwriting sheets um, and then also the packet in my Google Drive that I build per project. Um, I don't go over the information because there is some personal stuff on it, uh, but you guys can see what I collect per project too. So I'll pull that up later if you guys are interested and um, kind of poke around the computer. I don't have any beautiful slides, but um, I also wanted to bring you guys some energy just around the high level process of private money. Um, like he said, I'm in one of Pace's communities. I work closely with sub two students. I don't do creative beyond seller finance. My main focus is anytime anyone needs Gator, but mostly financing fix and flips. So we have- Can you elaborate on what Gators? Yeah, yeah. Um, you guys want to touch on that at the end a little bit and I can get, jump into some Q and A because obviously there's like mechanics involved, you know, and we can talk about how to use it. Um, so I do plan on touching on, on that and, I'll, and hopefully you guys can use it. Um, obviously, once you learn how, uh, we can talk about the mechanics of it, then you can really leverage it, maybe on some of your contracts or deals. Um, so let's just jump into private money. Um, I would sign up for one paces communities and I was like, man, where do I fit in, right? So I had this underwriting background, I was like, well, I don't just want to do that because I do like working on actual real estate projects. So I was like, well, I don't want to be completely the back office guy. So I was like, well, let me get out there and start meeting people. And it turns out a lot of people are doing flips or they're trying to get into a property themselves. So that was like, there's a huge market for private money. I think I was like, oh my gosh. Well, there's all these leads, all these deals, tons of stuff to buy. As you guys know, like if you added all the money in the world, you'd have a huge portfolio, right? Well, where's the gap, right? Where, where's the gap? Why do I see all these people needing 25, 30, 50, 100, $200? Well, they're all either putting their money elsewhere or they don't have it. So now you need to say, we need people who can identify good deals, right? I mean, again, if you had all the money in the world, but then you didn't have a good deal, what, what would it matter, right? So you have to be around people who are saying, okay, I'm gonna get good at vetting this project. So the numbers that I usually hit are probably around 15 to 20 deals a week. And we may choose one, to move forward on. So that's probably about the ratio I look at. And those, those aren't posts, leads, or anything. I mean, there's like hundreds of those. So like if you want to take it one step further, you're looking at, you probably have to look at, you know, you just have to scroll for days, right? But to get into them, to do what I call first level review is probably, you know, maybe even upwards of an hour per deal, right? And this is, I'd probably do more if I didn't have stuff in escrow or, or ongoing projects, to be honest with you. Um, or hiring, hiring out like a, a service on a deal, like helping someone with their deal um, or networking. So that's just kind of the lay of the land is that I really saw a market of helping myself know whether or not a deal is bad, good, or great, and then helping other people do that too. Huge need. So as you guys get good at that, don't forget the people who are just starting out that need help vetting. Or patch them in with someone who's done a flip, invites you over to see it, shows you how they did it, shows you their numbers that they break down. So there is extreme value in that, and I think communities need that. So, um, and don't be afraid to do a few deals with them. Don't be afraid to recommend them, bring value however you can. Um, that's what I did and, and that's what I do. Uh, when you patch into other people who have experience and then you always give it back to people. So, you know, 
that way you just have another partner that you can do a deal with in the future. If you help them create you know, a good deal, make some profit, you can do it again. So um, that's just the way I, I look at it. Um, so let's jump into private money. You guys all think I was about to say private money lending because that's what people look at it as. What we actually do is a slight slant on that and partner with people. So we look at it as private money partnering. Now, that does include equity in some deals. If you can work it in, I am working on that, not only to buy deals for myself. Primarily duplexes, I'll look in a lot of different red states, um, and even some blue ones. Um, but uh, when you come at it from a partner lens, you're building, like I said, people in a deal that, that help wanted to be successful. They're bringing different resources to the table. They're bringing the contract in the first place. Um, so again, it's all value. And if you guys, who's been to a closing table on a deal? How many people freaking pop up at the end? How many people that you never heard of are doing something at escrow through escrow? It just happens. It's like, get used to it. To be honest with you, it, it probably, I don't know if anyone's ever said this or I want to phrase this right, but it, it takes like a tribe to cr yeah. close a deal. Like we were closing uh, on a deal, side story. Um, we're closing on a deal. Uh, it was in Fairfield, California. And um, that's how a company would not write the problem story note. I'm just like, everybody else writes it for us. Like, what, what do we got to do? Oh, you got to go pay your own lawyer. I say, okay, so we got to go track down our own lawyer, you know, a thousand bucks to go draft up some legal docs and make sure we're all covered. We'll cover docs at the end in the funding process. But um, it's like, okay, just one more person we need to add with a skill set, you know, then, and it's a valuable part and we can't move forward without it. So again, I'm not afraid to pay anybody or bring people to the table to close a deal. Like I said, it takes a tribe, it takes resources. So if you're bringing partners to the table, someone asked me for another deal. I said, hey, I'm, there's no collateral in it for me. I can't fund it. I don't think it's a bad deal. It just doesn't fit my parameters. Do you want to find a partner to fund it with you? Great. I just want to let you know, like I haven't fully vetted this. So I'm not standing by it or anything like that. I'm not underwriting. But uh, the point is, if you find the right person, you can do you know, plug and play on scenarios. And so you're always finding partners, keeping uh, partners in the table. But we'll cover that more. So I have a few questions for you guys. Now that you know I'm coming at it from a partner lens, who needs PMO? Who needs more money? Who needs access to capital? Okay, good, good. You guys were a little shy. Okay, let me ask you another question. I expected a resounding to maybe two hands at the same time. I'm just joking. But who wants to, uh, who wants to find a private money partner with capital? So you can say, help, I have a good deal. You should fund it. Yeah, everybody, right? Who wants to create a PML? Create? Create. Create private money. Create. Yeah. Well, then elaborate on that. Well, I really want to rewire each and, our, each and every conversation. And so if I say, Kevin, let's go back to your deal. Six slides back, but no joking. Um, he created value. So what, what I'm looking for is people who are doing projects like that and are creating value like the one you're standing in, right? So he's creating private money. So he can say, oh, well, if I bring a partner in and you're, you're, I'm bringing the deal, you're bringing the capital, what is it worth to each other? They say, okay, well, let's just call it how much money are you creating on the back end, right? And do you want to split that, right? We bring our resources and we split the profit. So a lot of people look at it like interest rate, then you got to get into, um, are you a lender? Are you a hard money lender? That's a more complicated transaction for me. I look for people who are partnering with deals. For instance, I'm foregoing my typical private money returns on a project because he's just gonna give me equity. Pretty cool, right? Why? It's because we are gonna create a partnership to do a lot more deals together and we have a similar buy box and I also have TCs that can help do a particular transaction. I was talking to Josh and he was like, I need a TC in California who can do creative. I was like, I got you one. 
okay, now I need to talk about structuring the deal. It's like, okay, let's, let's talk about it, right? Or if someone, I pass them into someone who says, okay, do you have a sub two surfacer that can assume, that will not assume, excuse me, terminology, that can help me sub to a mortgage and make sure that that process goes right. Yes, I know that. Uh, I know that person that knows how to structure it, has all the paperwork, and who has an attorney um, that he can go to for any questions on that too. Right, constantly adding resources per however we need to tackle a deal or bring value to the deal. And then we look at what we make on the back end and then we split it up. So yes, some profits come from closed escrow, but again, most are partners helping you to create value on the back end. So that's why I said, you really need to look at people who are saying, oh, I don't just need it to take it and borrow it. I need to find out people that are creating it, right? And partners that want to create and then profit share. That's how I look at it. So thanks for entertaining my, my long-winded explanation of getting us to the point where we're, where we're re -rock, excuse me, rewiring the conversation there. All right, so the four steps of funds. I guess I was just gonna talk about just money. Now we're gonna talk about, again, the, the, we talked about the end goal of where we're splitting profits, but let's go back to how we start from the beginning. And this is where everybody can start too. So, four steps of funds. Marketing. Who would have thought we started at marketing? Doing exactly what Kevin is doing, right? Bringing resources. Here's how you do it online. Here's how you use ChatGPT. What am I doing? I'm marketing the place you're standing in. Oh, you guys need resources? Come talk to me. Here's all my links. Here's how you know I'm making this video to reach more and more people. Marketing. And I have, I have a rule that I wake up every day. I take a cold shower because I... It, <laughs> I'm serious, even in the dead of winter, I live in the mountains, I live at high elevation, and I take a cold shower every morning, and it's just to tell myself one thing, I won't compromise or cut any corners. Every freaking day, even when it's like 30, 40 degrees, it's just my way of saying, this is the one thing I don't wanna do, and I'm gonna do it. People call it eating frogs. The grossest thing you can think of, just do it, make a sandwich, maybe start something easy, throw, some, throw a hard task you're procrastinating on right in the middle and eat the sandwich. Mine is a cold shower. And then I have another rule right after that. I mark it before I eat breakfast and then I mark it after I eat breakfast. And it's just because I need to remind myself every day there's no cutting corners, I need to do the work, I need to do something that when I'm tired and I don't wanna do it, and I'm like, I need coffee first, nope. I go and mark it and then I have my coffee, food, and then I mark it again. Because that's what you need to be doing. So whatever your routine is, just throw marking into it. Go do something else and then mark it again. It's that critical because you need to be in conversations and you need to, well, we're gonna get to that. We're gonna get to the conversations first, but. You need leads. You always need leads. This is a conversation of like resources, right? What, what, are you, what are you doing once you have a lead, right? You've competed, you fought through social media, you fought for everyone's attention, and then what are you doing with that next? Well, you're having a conversation with them. Someone was like, oh, I need to do more, like, I need to do more marketing. I'm like, that's the way you said that sounds a little hollow. Like, what are you really doing? Are you just saying four people heard about me? before breakfast, I was like, okay, good job. That's like step one. Get that person on the phone or Zoom. The, the point is like, I, I like to say, didn't need it anyway. I'm gonna, I'm gonna rock on, I'm just gonna take center stage over here. So, um, where was that? Conversations. Take the action. Like, you guys can obviously tell, like, that's critical. But everyone says, like, oh, you need to be an action taker. You need to be an action taker. Have you ever built, have you ever sat down and be honest with you? I'll be honest with you. Ever sat down and say, what should I do next? Have a conversation with someone. Like, or like, oh, crap, I don't know what to do. What's on my to-do list? Have a conversation with someone. Like, honestly, compete to have conversations. Don't be an action taker. Be a conversation taker. Like, if you're, if, like, some people say, never eat lunch alone. It's because the heart of it is, is that you have to find out what someone wants, needs, 
and then find someone how to deliver it. And if you're looking at it, like bringing resources and having a conversation, like I'm sure he talks about saying like, if you go to a seller, like you find out like, what are their extra motivations on top of the sale? What are the, what's their story? What can you bring them? Is this house like inside my end buyer's box? Like he's always asking himself, I'm sure other conversations of like dots to connect and the conversations and networking are where those dots connect. If you have enough of them, you just start to see them. It just starts to make sense. Like, okay, I've seen someone use that strategy before. Oh, I know what YouTube to, video to go rewatch, right? I forgot most of it, but I have it, you know, referenced somewhere in my brain. If it's, if it's just around money, um, you won't probably do a lot of deals. You might say, if I only brought money to the table, uh, I probably would do like one deal every couple months. But right now, um, probably raising and closing um, maybe a quarter of a million per quarter. So I'm on target to probably do about a million a year in at least kit. My basis is 12 to 20% of that capital raise through projects and acquired doors in the meantime. So it's not all about money, it's really the conversations and problems that you're solving. So again, market, 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 but the goal is conversation. So be a conversation taker. That's, that's number one, you guys thought it was just about money. It's about bringing resources, solving a problem, aligning preferences, aligning skills. Uh, so much you can bring. You could say, hey, I had this transaction coordinator who knows exactly what to do to carry this transaction for us across the finish line. Um, let's go into raising capital. So Kevin said an important thing during your presentation. He said, Brad said one thing on the phone. He's like, my people need good deals. Why? Because there is more money out there than good deals. You guys probably don't talk about your bank account, just like everyone else does it, right? I'm up here talking about like resources and going and talking to people and figuring and solving problems and bringing, you know, bringing solutions to people. Why? Because it's, it is more important than money because you have 401ks, IRAs, HELOCs, inheritances, friends and family that don't know what to do with their money. I know doctors that are just saying, just give me 10%. Like, I don't, I don't need anything than that. It's just, I need, just needed to get out of the stock market. And I was like, same thing here. Like, you make money and then you start feeling all this risk and you're like, uh, this thing could go down, right? So you're just saying, okay, where are the people that now, now his biggest problem is not money. His, his thing is where are people doing good deals, right? And I've got to be meeting the Kevins in the world doing flips like this, right? And I had to say, hey, he's helping other people. Say, here's how I do it. And I say, okay, now I need to meet that whole group, right? So then um, maybe I can bring some skills to help make sure those deals are safe. Or present a deal on, and, and help you maybe pitch it to someone else, so, right? So how do you build a prospectus? And you say, oh, hey, here's my partner. He's done a deal. He can show you his track record. So now you're just bringing someone, a partner into the deal just to, just to have more credibility. Right? When Pace says uh, no credentials, no credit, he's, he, that is a video of his credentials. Right? How creative is that? Pretty cool, right? So let's make a video and then we'll go through a set of HUDs. Right? I have that in the package. Again, it's on a, a live deal and I'll, I'll give you guys a peek at that later. But again, the money is really out there. Um, he asked me to talk about Gator. A lot of people are signing up for that course every single week saying, where do I put my money? All, every single week, I see, <laughs> I see a big post in the Facebook group, welcome everybody to this, and they're like, okay, what do I do? <laughs> where, <laughs> where do I invest my money? Right? Really what they're saying is, can someone help me invest this and then teach me how to do it safely, please? Right, so um, I have to go in there and now it's my job to go have a conversation with them. Show them my process, show them my credibility, 
ask them what, what markets they want to buy in, right? Say what, ask them what they do like, what they don't like. Oh, you want to do everything by yourself? That's going to take you a little bit longer, but you can, you can do your first deal six months later. I, I had to teach them the same thing I said about him. It's like, I need you to start the transaction by going to the seller just to start a chain of events so Kevin can flip the house. Right, so raising capital is like just like base, just like the video, just like this conversation right now is building credibility with other people, right? And also saying, do you want to do flips or do you want to do sub two acquisitions? And then do you have a buy box? Can I help you um, define that buy box, right? Or do you just want to see what other people are doing? What what? What can I show you to help you narrow down what you want to do? Do you want to do the whole thing or do you want to find a niche within a transaction? Are all important conversations that I got to get people um, on Zooms or on a call about. So really raising capital is not a pre-commit. It's really finding the conversation with people, aligning everything and then showing them your credibility that you're saying, oh, I'm going to bring you a pipeline of deals or I can show you exactly what I did and what I'm trying to repeat. Okay, so when you do that, when you get a good deal and when you do it, I'm not saying market the crap out of it, I'm saying get into a conversation with someone who's interested and then show them and you'll say, hey, they'll say, hey, I wanna do a deal with you. So they go, perfect, you wanna fund a 50-50? And they're like, yes, let's split the risks. Now they have credibility because they can say, here's what I funded with Brad or with Kevin. So that's raising capital in my mind, or at least the most efficient way. Yes, it, does, it takes relationship building, maybe a little bit of time, maybe a little bit of work, but this is, this is all work and this is the way you do it. The next thing we'll do is talk about underwriting. I can talk about um, Kevin Zeal. Uh, when he pulled up the numbers, let's see. I ran a quick calculation, Kevin said, he, uh, he got it for 210 off the wholesaler, put 68 in, uh, and you're, so you're about 278 in, right? You haven't sold yet. Okay, so we're at a little bit of, you know, two months carrying costs because the market's, you know, inventory's low and the moving fast, right? What are we, under a month, 27 days per your presentation for how fast the market's moving? I think you said you are going to list it higher, but let's say 278, uh, and you were going to list it for 425, but you say your ARV was 400, right? Yeah. So obviously his ARV is conservative. That's 69%, right? 0.69. That's a perfect math. I would have put 50 grand on your deal. Or you need 68. You brought, you brought 18 on your own. You're like, oh, 50 grand income is perfect. He knows he has reserves. So I'm like, oh, he's confident. He wants to do a good deal. His numbers are solid. So if you have a house that where you remain under like every dollar in to every dollar out, you're at 70% ARV, you're going to be doing a good deal, right? You're going to cover buyer and seller agent commissions. You're going to cover maybe a 10% drop in the market. What else are you going to cover? Uh, let's say last minute carrying costs, maybe some sellers concessions. Um, well, standard costs. Anything else I'm missing? Insurance, probably that. Not necessarily carrying costs, but like at, at the end of the transaction, just any, any, just standard closing costs. You're gonna cover all that. But he's saying, oh, I'm gonna list it a little bit high because I have, I have some wiggle room on the timeline to, to complete the sale. You know, let's see if we can get 15, 15K more. But, if he's staying below that, guess what? He can also refinance it and say, I want to hold this as an Airbnb. Why? Because banks usually only leverage a cash out refi up to 80%, 75, 80%. So now he has a backup strategy, right? I think it's going to sell. Who thinks it's going to sell? Probably in a month and a half, maybe. We all wish him luck, right? You guys got to give him, put it out there that, I, that he thinks he can do it. My man's going to get just like it as a buyer. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, get, getting in close. 
Yeah. Who wants him to make 100K? Yeah. <laughs> I, want, I want Kevin to make 100K. So, um, but that's a good deal because there's yet? a buffer there. Huh? Is it listed yet or? 425, she listed it. Did you, have you gotten any like interest yet? First day, open house. Oh, I'll say it's first day. Okay. All right. Sorry. Well, I'll talk a little bit louder and, and uh, make sure people hear. That's right. I want to open a window. Uh, it's not going to get much warmer. Um, anyways. <laughs> <laughs> There's only upside, right? There's only upside. <laughs> um, but what I'm saying is, in general, that's he's working what I call the magic formula. He hit the target number in terms of completing the project. When you look at every dollar that goes into it, he got it at a good price and you know set the foundation for him to flip it with good margins. So that's a high level underwrite. I does a little bit of napkin math for you guys. I did not plan this. Kevin, did I, did I plan to promote your deal this hard? Thank you so much. <laughs> but also, um, I didn't know the numbers on the house until I saw the slide, but that's how you do that just real quick. So you can say, go back to your, what was your name again? Dante. Dante? Yeah. Nice to meet you. Dante, don't pick this up where you can't assign it to us or anything over 210. Mm. Now, if we knew, we can reverse engineer and find that number, find that sweet spot. So he says, oh, I know. I can get it really low and increase my margin, or I can say, hey, I don't need much. Um, maybe I can just get the seller under contract for 190 or whatever it is. So he makes those decisions for himself, but he knows where we need it to do the flip. And so now he can call the sellers on this block, you know? You know, exactly. right? I gave my guy a little bit of a discount. <laughs> well, but you know, like yeah. where, you know, you know where he is and he's, yeah, exactly. and he's giving you that proof of what he can do. Yeah. And so now you can say, if you want to make more so, you say, hey, I just need to tell the seller where I need to first get them, you know, under contract. So it's all a chain of events when it comes to underwriting. And I look at every dollar that goes in, where we're starting with the contract, where we're picking it up, how much the rehab is. Uh, we need to factor in the, you know, the unpermitted stuff. Everything goes into that. So when we do a deeper dive into the project, we do look at all that stuff. So there's a little bit of work. I'm going to skip over that step three of underwriting because as you can tell, it can go very deep into the project. All you need to do is say, hey, Kevin, can I talk to you again a little bit more about what you explain while renovating the project? Right? And if, you're, if you ever want to flip or if you ever have flip, you're going to have to know all of those steps. And then you can tell me and I'll say, all that makes sense. Do you or do, do you personally have the ability to perform when it comes to those renovations? Are you working with a licensed GC, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So really going down to those projects, that's what I do. I drill down and then uh, work all those numbers. I can, get, I can give you guys some snapshots of a project um, in a little bit. But again, this is the high level stuff that we're talking about. And how lucky am I to have this perfect example to, to um, fall back on um, when it comes to explaining some of this stuff. So finally, let's talk about funding documents. This is a good segue. Step number four, in, in, uh, in funding is the actual funding process when you're bringing those funds to escrow. Okay, so we've marketed, we've aligned all the partners. What do we do? We, had, we, we hustled to have conversations with them, right? We raised the capital, we've brought them our credibility. Now they wanna fund with us, whether we're doing the project, getting it under contract, um, or um, I'm showing them, again, what, what I've done. Uh, next, we've underwrote the, the property. We went through those details, right? I've shown the numbers of Kevin's flip and they're just like, wow, I wanna make six figures. Let's do this. We're ready, okay. Now let's talk about some of the protections and, and paperwork when we go to the, we're always going through escrow. We're always making sure there is a second lien on the property. Right? So you're backed by um, 
the, fun, the, the profits and capital return coming back to you once the house sells or it's refinanced. Um, so some of those notes, excuse me, some of those documents are a joint venture agreement with the borrower, right? That's what makes you a funding partner, like we said. Then we go and we have the lien, which is a deed of trust or a mortgage, typically in second position. Okay, we also have a lender's title insurance policy. We also have a hazard, um, uh, hazard policy, of course, like he was saying, insurance costs. And uh, any partner uh, bringing capital to the table is going to be listed as a payee. Uh, let's see what else. Those are the big ones. Uh, so let's recap. Promissory note, joint venture agreement, lender's title, insurance policy. Um, did I have anything else on my list? Um, and just making sure you have a lien. At times, I'll be, I'll be honest, we have a, um, we have a cross collateral. So depending on whether you're first position, second position, um, or if um, it's a, maybe the project's a little bit more lean in terms of equity, you cross collateralize it. Um, well, that's an example of that. So I typically like to use um, another rental property that keeps everything in the commercial world where you're not doing any personal property, um, any personal residences or anything like that. So um, when that's needed, the best thing is someone else's um, uh, where they have equity in another rental. Yeah. Cross. Yeah. Had it. No problem. Um, based on the investor's request or just? Depending on the deal and investor um, criteria. So yes, absolutely. It comes down to the risk tolerance um, or preferences of the investor. I like to say whether or not the personality comes into play, investor personality. I like to say another, one, another terminology is uh, investor DNA. You build that into your process of what you need per deal. But again, if you're hitting that 70% of ARV number, um, you'd be pretty confident it's a solid deal. Yeah, absolutely. And your, your partners, as in the borrower, uh, investor, and fixer, flipper, um, is going to have experience so they can replicate this project, awesome. right? Uh, so that all goes into it. Um, that pretty much wraps up uh, my... Uh, my presentation and, and speech on private money partnering. You guys all thought I was going to talk about private money lending. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint you. But uh, hopefully, uh, if you guys, also I'll make myself available again for any resources, uh, copying, underwriting, um, or any, any um, access to those softwares that can help you guys do whatever um, function you're doing, wholesaling or, or whatnot. Um, any other quick questions there? I'm going to give a quick intro to um, the Gator side as well. I have one more, but I'll wait to the end. Okay, cool. Uh, let's talk about let's talk about the paperwork for for Gatoring. How do we get money, by the way? How do you get money? Uh, got a deal. Credit card? Yeah. You take credit card. Credit card records, brother. So Gatoring. I think it's a, a confusing topic. You guys have all probably heard about it. Who's seen a Gator Method or funding on Facebook? Anyone? You guys haven't even pitched that? You're lucky. You're lucky. What's the name? Uh, the Gator Method by Pace Morby. Okay, so this is going to be interesting. Okay, we're going to start from scratch. I'm just going to say it's an escrow deal. I, I, I asked earlier if anyone's had anything they uh, were at the closing table with, uh, but let's, let's use uh, Dante's deal. Um, did you offer them any EMD? Uh, I don't think so, though. No. Did you have an inspection period? Yeah. Okay, how long was your escrow? Uh, what did we close in, 10 days? Something like that. Yeah, I think I, I put it as like 14 day close. Nice. Yeah. Perfect. Per yeah. Well, the, your inspection period. Yeah, my inspection yeah. period was seven days because I knew I would sell this bass. So I was just trying to, I already, I locked it up at a great price, so. Yeah. I usually put it though at 14 days. Like if you want to, if you have a deal that might be a little bit tight, I'll put it, honestly, I'll even put it at 30 days, like for an inspection period. Um, 
Why not? Technically, yeah. Yeah. Two days. So let's say you did put down your own money and you, you said it at 14 days or 30 days. We write into our contracts that if we do an EMD, and you'll say you step on the floorboard and your foot falls through the floor and you burst one of the pipes and it's full of lead any or full of rusted lead anyways and you're like, oh my gosh. I thought he was just doing drywall and flooring and the beautiful kitchen, you know, appliance package. Now he's doing plumbing. Yeah. Right? Now we need a structural engineer, you know, to check out you know, okay, wait, actually it looks slanted, right? So when you come into those things and you're just like, Kevin cannot get this flip done for 68K anymore, right? Um, we need to back out of our inspection period or, you know, again, something turns up that, that would blow up the budget. So we build into our contracts that that EMD is refundable within the inspection period. So it's always good to write that, especially if you need a specialist to come out here and they're like, oh, the electrical's bad. Here's, an, here's you know, again, something else that can blow up the budget. It's, it's old, it's outdated, it needs to come up to spec. Um, uh, we cannot be at that 70% ARV. So what we do is we say, hey, if there's an agent or a seller that wants you to actually commit to, let's say, a $1,000 EMD, we loan that for 14 days, 30 days, whatever it is, for Kevin to come in and say, hey, here's my five grand. I'm going to be the end buyer on this. Here's my EMD. I'm going to go either double check his inspection or come in and build in my own inspection. Right? I'm either going to piggyback that um, or get it in a contract myself and actually refund his 1K empty. So pretty much if he put it down, he's going to get that 1, 1K back for building in, for getting that under contract and building in that inspection period. Um, so that's, that's one thing is that escrow just held it until Kevin was ready to commit, put down his own deposit, um, and is as if Dante got it back. So, Part of the, the strategy is to say, hey, you now see what he's done. You get people showing that you're serious by saying, hey, I need to do five of these deals on this block. Um, I'm going to go put down 1K here, 1K here, 1K here, 1K here, and he's going to go and snatch up all of them. If not, I may actually not find an end buyer and say, hey, I don't think anybody is going to pick up this contract from me. I had to say, hey, sorry, go ahead and put it back on the market, or if it was off market, say, I have to back out because I don't think I can find an end buyer that will look at this like a deal to where his, e his EMD is then refundable. Now in California, we're in a mutual release state, so you do need additional uh, documentation to protect yourself, and you do need the seller to sign off on that, saying that it is uh, not only within the contract, but I've signed this extra piece of paper saying that I know that when he does a walkthrough, he's not gonna find anything. If he does an inspection, he may say it's no longer a deal and then back out. So again, I call it an escrow deal. It's short-term microfunding, but it allows him to go in this neighborhood and beyond and maybe do inspections a couple other times. Now, can he totally skip that step? Absolutely. But um, have you ever had anyone say, oh, I just got on a contract with someone else? Like in a hotter market like this, like have you, have you ever seen someone look at your offer comp and compare it to another wholesaler's? Oh, yeah. So any competition there? Oh, all the time. Well, well what, what could EMD do? Um, Make you stand out, right? Yeah, yeah. There you definitely. go. And yeah. I'll just basically use Actually, no, I probably wouldn't use it because I can't do it myself. But yeah, I would just tell them like, hey, look at how much EMD they're putting down. And, you know, I'm willing to put down 5000 like with the Gator Landing or something. And that could make your offer stand out more because more serious. I even like the way he said, he's like, 5000 like, is a, does that sound attractive to you, right? I'm serious. So, again, this is not your money. This is if we move forward, right, and go to, you know, and he, you know, finds an end buyer. But 
Sometimes he'll have to say what makes my offer stand out. It's either going to be a condition, term, or EMD is one of the ways to do it. So in super competitive markets, that can help. Um, obviously, he can also show I just closed this house over here. Here's my credibility along with my EMD. Right? It's another thing I would do if I was a wholesaler. I like, I would like, I would love working with him. If you guys, you guys should pick his brain, do what he does. And I love promoting wholesalers who are like good at it, get it. And even our rapport right now was just like, oh, this makes sense. I could do that. I'm not always going to do that, but just another tool in the belt of something you can leverage. And that's one of the strategies and paperwork that uh, is introduced along with that strategy. So it's basically a commitment to pay on the deal. Yeah. Now so go check out some of Pace's videos. He calls it the engagement ring. <laughs> okay. It's beautiful. They were like, oh, I love that. That makes sense. Like, And I would say, too, like to piggyback on that, I think it would be best used for like on market type deals, too, especially if you're wholesaling. Like, because typically when you're wholesaling or when you're starting out, you don't have as much, you know, funds on you. So, like, the Gator method, you know, what do real estate agents want? They want like somebody with serious down payment on the property, END. So, that's where they'll really come in. For off market deals, Typically, at least what I run into, like sometimes I don't even put down EMD because people don't care. Like they don't know. They don't know what to look. They for. don't know, they know exactly. Like, but I'll, an agent will. I'll even put literally another agent though, like you said. They the they sniff that out. Yeah. They okay, go, you have two days. Yeah, exactly. You, they'll say, hey, you have, or if they're really keen and sniff it out, they'll say, hey, you you have 48 hours, or I can't afford to to take this off the market uh, without an option fee. Yeah. Well, to, to turn down other people and stop marketing, yeah. Yeah. right? There's two it's things you have to do. Time. What's that? Buying time. Kind of. Yeah, correct. I mean, hopefully he already has an empire, right. but um, other people, um, I've looked at funding for them, had an empire back out. Right. And they can, they're saying, hey, I can put this down, it is refundable, but I technically still have 10 more days. And then he gets back on the horse to find an buyer. Is that the inspection? What's the inspection period you're talking about? Yeah, that's basically the inspection period. So the inspection period is like the time that you have to basically find a buyer. God, if you don't find a buyer by that time, but that's why you lock up deals at a good price. You have a contract, you have a power. Like for instance, I had a deal where I got a, a under contract too high and I had to renegotiate over $50,000. Sometimes that happens. No, I was way off on my analysis at first, but if you build a rapport with the seller, you can also renegotiate. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there's uh, terms and concessions. Remember I said like when you find things that might blow up the, the renovation right. budget, right? you can go back and say, hey, this is the reason why I know I thought it was this price. It was, it was this price before I knew I had to replace electrical and plumbing. Got it. Yeah. So now Kevin needs a better discount. Yeah. To make the deal hard. To get the house up uh, to par dur during the renovation, so he can sell it for X. Mm -hmm. Got it. So inside the inspection period is, is literally time for you to inspect the house exactly. and see and, and and nail down that renovation budget. Are you running your own or are you having someone else do that? For what? Inspection. Oh, I don't do an inspection. Yeah. Unless like... Well, you do, you do walkthroughs, right? You, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, but like, I mean, I'll do an inspection if I'm like, okay, I know the house needs some more work and I just want to get a bigger discount. I'll do an inspection. Like, and then I'll show the seller like, hey, this needs to be done. This needs to be done. This is why we need to be a little bit lower. And usually you, you have a rapport with them. So they'll come down. Uh, Usually, yeah. Yeah, so basically negotiation, you know, uh, time and, and um, for you to have, you know, potentially ammunition to see if you really kick the tires and see if you want to move forward, right? It, now, a lot of wholesalers don't look at it like that, but that's, it, it's, again, a tool you can leverage and build into the process. Um, again, complete, complete an option. Some people actually don't even lock up the contract before they before they they don't actually technically assign it to an end buyer. Speaking of assignment, let's segue into the second strategy. 
And this course is still early on, but a second strategy um, before they build out the course content is uh, double closing. Anybody ever heard of that? Yeah? ABC. Okay. ABC, always be closing. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> Um, yes, that's exactly what it is. So um, escrow and title companies, different states do this different ways, but the basics of it is he gets a, a contract to buy it for, um, what was it, uh, 180, 185? 175. 175, thank 175. you. 175? <laughs> <laughs> oh, what did I do? <laughs> That's not right. So that is the A to B. It's, it's wholesaler by having a purchase uh, agreement, a purchase and sale with, directly with the seller. And um, he either flips that, assigns it, or does a double close. A double close is really cool. A lot of people haven't heard about it, but it is when I actually give him the money mm -hmm. uh, to actually buy it. Who are you in that transaction? Uh, I was, I'm his partner. Oh, okay, got it. Yeah. So I am bringing the funds, right? We can call it whatever we want to, but actually the money, he buys it and the money never leaves escrow. His name goes on title very temporarily, but um, I give him the funds to actually buy it. He doesn't see the money, right. but instead of selling the contract to Kevin, the A to B contract, he actually sells the house to Kevin. So that's one of the strategies we use. So that, like, that's where you have to basically pay the closing costs. There's two sets of closing costs. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's 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 pretty minimal. Um, yeah. Again, it's very short term. It usually happens usually happens in about 24 to 48 hours um, or same day. Why would you do that? Why would I do that? Yeah. Well, when he goes and gets that house on contract, he, what does he say? I'd like to buy your house. He actually buys a house. Right. So again, it gives you credibility with the seller. What are some other benefits around that too? Is um, the title company may not do the transaction otherwise. They may not say, we cannot use Kevin's money to close that first contract. <coughs> or we will not allow him to sell it to you or assign it to you. And they say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna change title companies. <laughs> and they're like, and then, the, and then the agent or the seller goes, no. Then what do you do? Right? Uh, you, actually, you actually buy it. Um, it's a very small uh, transaction fee. Usually the market um, is used around two to 3% of the purchase price. Um, some people even do one and a half percent. So, um, the other thing there too is... Um, but you have to pay closing costs twice on first and second transaction? Yeah, that's pretty minimal too. It's not like a... It's, it's typically, uh, you know, a, a small amount. Um, if there are any other things, I usually see more closing costs still on the second transaction. You know, when the title company is just facilitating that first close. Um, have you ever tried explaining uh, like assignment a contract to a, to a seller or anything like that. Would, wouldn't it always be easier to just say, I'm the buyer, I don't even need to explain anything else. Yeah. Try to definitely. keep it as simple as possible. It so this is one of the, this yeah. is one of those times. Some people, it, it depends. Yeah. You know? where, where they're just like, hey, no way, I'm really confused now. Or, oh, I want to back out or anything. Yeah. It's like, oh, well, sure. actually, I don't want you to feel that way because yeah. you actually can't, you know? <laughs> Because we're in a contract, yeah. right? So let's avoid all that. And now I don't have to over explain myself. I can actually just purchase it. Especially if you got somebody that doesn't like wholesalers. Because there's people who literally will tell you that. They're like, yeah. like I don't like working with people. Are you one of them people that, that, uh, sure. that you know, are not the actual buyer but the middleman? I'm like, hey, that's one of the things I do. But typically we're looking to buy houses. Yep. This is usually how I combat that. But another note, Two on the uh, double closing is the buyer doesn't see your assignment fee. Uh, see, I was getting to the, oh, the okay. cherry on top. He <laughs> beat me to it. Okay. I didn't so, know you were say that. Okay, I know already. <laughs> 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 I 
I mean, because I don't got anything to hide. I mean, <laughs> no, no, no. He, I, was, I, would only do, I would only do like fifteen thousand dollars or more, though. Honestly, like typically, people usually don't care about your assignment fee if it's a good deal for them. Yeah. So. I see. so uh, so there's, you know, obviously the, the assignment fee ranges, right, to as little as 10 grand. Absolutely worth the service at that point. Right. To anything more, there's a lot, there's still a lot of value, right, in, in, um, in uh, purchasing a home that no one wants to do the renovation on, right? Building up a... Uh, Actually making sure that we can do all this work and still have money left at the end is absolutely valuable. So, but yes, some people will go, I should have made that money. <laughs> yeah. Or what is my house really worth dilapidated but as is, right? How can you, how can you reconcile the two, right? Well, now he's bringing value by saying, I'm confident enough to go out and perform the service, you know, for my end buyers, and I know how to renovate houses, like take the first step in renovating houses in this area. So it's absolutely a service that he's providing. Otherwise, will Kevin find every deal he's ever found all by himself? Probably not. Like I have a lot of faith that he'll have enough to to do business. But if he has a lot of people sending him really good deals and, and finding those good deals and people with experience, I mean, that's, that, that experience and the ability to find those sounds like that is not easy, nor going into um, a neighborhood that needs renovation before an actual retail buyer would even consider driving down the street to go find it themselves, unless you do this with it. So, um, again, I, I'm definitely in, in his uh, camp in defense, but when it comes to doing that, um, not everybody is willing to say, I, I would have just you know, sold it to Kevin. He said, be my guest. It sat on market for a year. You know, or my agent didn't perform or anything like that. I'm sure he sold, he sold homes that where agents didn't perform. So, um, yeah, absolute value, but one of the benefits is, I'm not saying, I'm not advising people hide the actual assignment fee, but the, buy, the, excuse me, the seller does not see the HUD on the second transaction. <coughs> so again, that's one of the benefits. Um, for some of the ones um, that we've done, um, it was a title company that did not allow one set of funds to be used twice for each contract. So they said, hey, we need a separate set of funds for each separate contract. Um, so sometimes it could be a title company. Um, there are state uh, laws. I think it's Illinois. Um, somebody, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm pretty sure that allows wholesalers to do one wholesale transaction or assignment of contract a year. Wow. And they're making that legislation. Also, Philadelphia. And a lot of people think Arizona is coming up next. One per year. Or you need to be licensed. Once in a year. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> All right. All right. I, I think I got. I think I got Dante in this one. Raise your hand if you're not surprised. He's like, oh, they're coming. They're coming. <laughs> so yes. So. I, I mean, it is, it is part of it, but um, uh, yeah, we'll be looking to expand that strategy more and more to help these projects still be completed. Uh, again, not for a terrible price. I think of it as just putting my cash and credit into escrow, pulling it back out, completing that tr transaction while he's still making the connection to the end buyer. So I don't think it'll entirely go away, but there will be you know, um, escrow companies who are looking to do a, you know, it's just like the same thing when you use Stripe, PayPal, right? You have a 1.5% Visa transaction fee, right? Is the same thing that's happening, but at the purchase price level of finding these deals. So it's not going to be a ton of, a ton of money. Uh, what's that for a hundred, a hundred K house, like, uh, just 1500 bucks. So it's not a huge transaction, but that's one thing we see coming down the pipeline to again make, the, make some of these deals happen. 
So we'll be working on additional um, ways that we finance stuff. But other than that, a lot of people um, in the community that I've met are actually doing deals themselves, picking up creative deals, funding entry fees, or um, private money lenders like me who are doing um, a lot of partnering with folks to complete flips. Flips, so mainly that's your portfolio on this. Yeah, and acquiring, so, and, 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 and buying properties too. Um, another thing, ooh, another one, we'll, I'll have to come back for this one, Kevin, and show them more of my underwriting, but loan sponsorships. So um, if you ever, if so, like I have a hard, excuse me, I have a flipper in New York and he can't get the hard money terms, so we can't even get a gap loan, um, like that 50K Kevin said he was looking for, um, which was, um, uh, two higher terms. It was like 6% origination fees, lawyer fees, legal fees, doc fees, underwriting fees. And he's like, I don't have all this money to get into it, plus 60 grand in reserves. Like, the hard money lenders just beating them up. Um, uh, so we would come in and sponsor it for um, profit sharing and equity um, or buy the deal and then refinance it out to them later you know, once we can help get them good terms. So that's one thing we're looking at. Whole completely different strategy, which, you know, you could even introduce, you know, LLC strategies into, you know, buying homes together. So lots of, lots of uh, more interesting stuff to, to talk about in the future. Um, get into company and underwriting, which could be a class, maybe a course, maybe uh, first one for free, Kevin. <laughs> 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 Any questions, guys? I have a question. Um, yeah. I know we all have no crystal ball, so what's the effect of this all wars going on with real estate locally? Oh my goodness, so this is a ma <laughs> mastermind uh, topic. Um, short answer, volatility. We were just talking about the mar Kevin's market update. By the way, great job. Um, but when you talk about um, politics, wars, unstable regions, that can absolutely trickle into you know, the US just the same way inflation has, right? We're not immune. We're not immune to inflation, and, and I say we're not immune to volatility. So you think the houses will go down further 5%, 10%? Yeah, also, don't forget that real estate is highly regionalized. So there's always going to be pockets of activity. And then you want to look at, you know, jobs too, right? What jobs are, what jobs are affected? Um, you know, can you, buy, can you still buy properties um, in areas that have um, uh, high manufacturing um, uh, um, companies and and jobs available, right? So now, what 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 are you seeing right now in Sacramento area and other places? Well, I would say just just from my experience, I've been in California a long time. Um, you know, looking at markets that were, I would I spent a little time researching what was affected mostly by two thousand eight. And for instance, Sacramento for me was more stable than Stockton, right? So, I, so I, again, I look at periods of market downturns like that and then just starting to compare markets to where I can still continue to invest, right? And which ones to avoid um, would be areas like that that were hit you know, hardest in 2008. Um, for me right now, I'll give you a target of something I don't think, I, don't, I think will only go up or at least stay stable, which is duplexes. Mm. So I just gave away my secret sauce is small multifamily. Um, I think will stay stable. Duplexes. Yeah, duplexes are hot in Sacramento. Yeah. Especially if you find a duplex that, like, that is within like a regular single family residential community. Yeah. Exactly. That they sell. Harder to comp. Some people might stay away from it, but usually long-term ownership, so they have high equity, they can, you can consider buying on seller finance, as well as most, most tired landlords were just letting it 
honestly go to shit because they didn't need to do anything to, get, to keep getting rents, right? They didn't need to provide a higher service. They didn't know how to raise the rents. So they might not even be near market rents. And they're just like, well, I can't pay for all this CapEx and renovations because you know my tenant's only paying 750. It's like, well, you should have actually been raised on them, continuing leases and putting that money back into it. How about the triplex in the Same thing. There's just bigger scale, right? So you say, hey, I need to go in there. Dante, can you help me, you know, estimate you know, a good market value or a good um, your maximum um, uh, allowable offer on it or acceptable, sorry, I messed that term up. But basically find a good entry price for it and calculate in whatever renovations we might need. And then can that, can that support me either getting a new 8% mortgage on it, a seller finance mortgage on it, whatever it is, can those rents that I can bring them up to not only renovate it, man manage it much better, maybe even get a property management in it so you know, I don't have to self-manage it like they were before. That's where headaches come in. That's where slip-ups happen. That's where people stop paying, where you're not actually delivering them you know, good quality service or an easy way to pay. Get them an online portal so they don't have to write you checks. I mean, I can't tell you like how mad I was <laughs> when I found out that like um, the last place I rented, I was down in Orange County. She was like, oh yeah, the other people have been paying me on Zelle. I was like, are you kidding me? I asked me to tell you when I could stop writing you a freaking check every month. And they were like, they've been paying you by Zelle? Oh my God, you said you didn't have Zelle. <laughs> anyway, I'm not bitter about that. I've moved on. <laughs> But anyways, it was basically the headaches of self-managing and where you can actually go in there and just the same way you can make a business more efficient, you can make rentals more efficient too, right? Good question though. I don't know how we got from Middle East to there, but I hope I was able to provide you some value. Speaking of different regions, so you're investing all over the states? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I would say I'm not in the, the majority with that, though, in terms of investors. Okay. That, that introduces a little bit of uh, uh, too much variability, for, and, and people do get uncomfortable with that. But what I also do is I like to partner with other folks like in that area. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm more comfortable because I build strong partnerships to where that's their market. I can rely on them for other resources and connections where we can get boots on the ground, et cetera. Uh, yeah. You know, no ATC in the area that can handle that type of transaction. Um, yeah. Or pay someone. Got it. What is ATC? Transaction coordinator. So every strong broker agent is familiar with a TC that they like to know. They like to turn over um, parts of the transaction to either get docu signs going, to talk to insurance companies, to do all the small ends and um, odds and ends in a transaction, plus kind of herd the cats in a transaction. Um, so that way you and I can go find another deal. So I'm more on the, the financing side for my background. Plus, I just love finding the deals yeah. and then saying, hey, complete this one. Keep me updated on how it's going. Yeah. Any yeah. other questions? Do you do commercial deals? No, Australia? no, I don't. Yeah. But I do know people that do, so, yeah. yeah. I have one that's not hospitality, in them, so. Okay, yeah, great. Yeah, absolutely. If you, um, I'll give you my Blink card uh, as well. So people, if you find this video helpful, make sure you also watch this video right here.